Have you heard of this quirky little shooter game called Doom, released in 1993? It was a revolutionary game that delivered fast action and violence, with graphics that were so realistic that the government blamed it for violence in real life. If you haven't heard of it, then maybe you have heard of a game that took all the tried, true, refined, and the tried, true, refined gameplay that had grown from the genre that Doom had given birth to and decided that it really should have cut its ties from that side of the family a long time ago. Doom, like Doom, put focus on fast, hard-hitting, visceral combat that emphasized movement, positioning, and target prioritization, instead of aiming iron sights over sandbags and ducking down until the cranberry jam goes away. You run around the arena, dodging enemies, shooting them full of holes, tearing them limb from limb. It's a fun ride, and while Doom's graphics aren't nearly as good as Doom's, they're serviceable. With Doom once again deciding that shooter games could be fun, a subgenre of FPS games was brought back to the spotlight of gamers all around the world. The Boomer Shooter. What even is a boomer shooter, you may ask your tiny, finely polished brain? Well, you see, it's, uh... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I think it just means an FPS with run-and-gun gameplay similar to the classics, usually with secret hunting side content. It's not like it's a term in the dictionary, how am I supposed to know? Enter New Blood Interactive, a new indie game development and publishing studio that has made a name for itself developing games to take inspiration from the classics, and whose members are the only reason I haven't deleted my Twitter account. The first big hit game called Dusk wears his boomer shooter status on its sleeve, releasing in 2018 to become a beacon of quality for indie shooters. Then, one year later in 2019, a medieval released to a very similar reception. Then, in 2020, the world caught fire. But just before that, another shooter game released in the March of that year that would take lessons learned from the previous game and expand on them to provide a somehow even more thrilling experience. That's right, My Hero 1's Justice 2. Oh yeah, and there was Doom Eternal. A direct sequel to Doom, Doom Eternal sacrificed visuals for even faster combat, adding a dash and a fucking grappling hook which in itself adds a whole two stars to my rating. More fast, more shoot, it's good, I love this game. I have a piece of art from it hanging above my monitor. Well, later that year New Blood would put a certain early access game on sale. Guess which game I put more hours into. I'd say it's a decent game and most people seem to agree with me. So I've decided to keep my one video tradition of making reviews of universally well-received games. Because, well... It's basically virtual crack. I'm starting to itch just thinking about it. Genuinely, playing the game to get footage for this video has delayed my making it somewhat because I can't sit there and write or edit afterwards. This game is being developed by like, two people I think? I use the present tense because, like I said earlier, this game is still in early access and it's the 12th highest rated game on Steam anyway. When I first saw this game make the rounds on the Steam homepage, I didn't really think much of it until I saw real gameplay of someone destroying what was the final boss at the time. I then immediately bought it. So now I have decided to take up the mantle to peer pressure you into buying this game. Come on, just play one little demo, it won't hurt. It's clear to see that Ultra Kill is a very specific style it is going for. That kind of low poly, low resolution style that emulates early PlayStation games. There are some people who seem to believe that graphical fidelity is everything, and if the game doesn't make your room temperature go up by an additional 15 degrees while playing, it simply isn't worth your money. If you're one of those people, I hope the wiring in your $6,000 space heater catches fire. The game's no doom, but I think it looks great. Plus, I think that this brutalist style of art design adds to the gameplay. Each enemy is easily identifiable at a glance with a unique silhouette and color pattern that is clearly identified against the background. All very important in a game as fast-paced as this. I said before you don't have any real knowledge of art design, but I can at the very least appreciate being able to see what's killing me. Okay. Not to mention I'm sure modeling and texturing new enemies takes significantly less time and resources to do this way, and I need to have my new Ultra Kill Addiction fueled as much as it can. In fact, due to this game still actively being developed, some visuals are due to change. While making this video, there's a visual upgrade to the shotgun, nail gun, and revolver, and I couldn't be bothered to re-record some of the footage, so there you go. However, if you don't like the carefully constructed visuals and prefer something a little more clown vomity, you can add your own custom color palettes to the game. All you need to do is make an image with all the colors you want, stick it in the game files, and select it as your palette, and the game will automatically recolor everything using the closest colors it can find in the image. Whatever witchcraft is being implemented here to make this work is probably stake-worthy, but I'm too busy playing to get my pitchfork. So let me start this section by saying that the most painful part of making this video is recording gameplay footage with the music turned off just felt wrong. Even the menu music makes me want to sit there and listen to it. Fortunately, I didn't need to turn off the game sound effects because the guns, all of them, sound great. And that little that plays whenever you parry or hit an enemy in a weak spot combined with the hit stop just... here, have a listen.
time to talk about the actual game part. Before I go too deep in, there is a free demo available on Steam that includes the first four levels of the game. If any of what I said so far and shown on screen interests you, go download and play that demo. Then buy the game and play it for yourself. I'm not going to ruin the experience for you and spoil everything, but for me, going through the game at least once blind to figure out some of the tricks on my own was a great experience. Go on, David, spend those 20 bucks. Ultra Kill starts by dropping you to a short tutorial that introduces basic movement and combat mechanics before giving you your first proper weapon, and the best weapon in the game, the revolver. The pace of the game takes some getting used to at first, especially with this unorthodox healing method. You heal off of enemies that you deal damage to up close, which encourages you to stay in the thick of it just in case you need a little pick-me-up. Then in the next level, you find your first weapon terminal. Here you can unlock and equip alternate modes for your weapons. Get the Marksman Revolver. Use it. Practice it. Worship it. This is what human ingenuity has led to. You have succeeded as a species. There's an 18 minute long video just about the coin mechanics. Then you get the shotgun and it's pretty good. And then you get the pump charge shotgun and it's very good. And then you learn to compare enemy projectiles and it's extremely good. And then if you take the shotgun and time it just right you can... Holy shit! Maybe now you can see why this is one of the best games ever made. Later you get the nail gun, a high damage rapid fire weapon that can make its projectiles home in on targets and go into fuller auto. At first I wasn't too fond of the nail gun, but now I've come around to see how useful it is for dealing huge damage very quickly. Plus there's a secret alternate mode that shoots saw blades, so that's pretty cool. The next weapon in your roster is your BFG of sorts. The rail cannon is a powerful weapon capable of massive damage as a cooldown displayed on your HUD. The default version fires a hit scan beam that pierces through all enemies in its path, usually vaporizing smaller enemies and heavily damaging larger ones. The screwdriver variant fires a projectile that sticks to a single enemy and causes massive bleeding, allowing you to drink them like a Capri Sun. The red variant causes a huge high damage explosion that would leave atomic shadows on the walls if this game was higher death. The latest major update to the game added a rocket launcher that I'm still getting used to. It only deals damage on direct hits, instead tossing smaller enemies around if you miss. If you knock an enemy into the air and then shoot them with it, it creates a much larger and deadlier explosion. The special ability of this weapon is to freeze your rockets in the air and then release them later for increased explosion radius or other fancy tricks. Plus, there's a grappling hook so I can officially bump my star rating in this game from an 8 to a 10. But what are cool guns if there's nothing to shoot? All the enemies in Ultra Kill stand down and provide different challenges. Even the lowly filth can be dangerous if you're looking away from your screen. You have single projectile shooters, high health enemies that fire inaccurate sprays, streams of projectiles, hit scan explosions, flamethrowers, flyers, booba, and these fucking things. Several of the levels have bosses to test your skills, such as angry construction equipment, you, and a punk-ass angel. Some of the earlier bosses show up in powered down forms as regular enemies, but most don't to provide unique challenges. The vast majority of this game is moving from combat arena to combat arena, clearing out enemies as fast and stylishly as possible, and then leaving the level. The second tent of boomer shooterism, if you recall, is secret hunting. Secrets can be as simple as an orb hidden under a platform, or as complex as whole secret boss fights. In addition, each layer has a secret level to find that requires much more careful exploration of the levels. These secret levels are a departure from the main gameplay loop, stripping away the combat arenas and replacing them with something completely different. For example, a secret level in the first layer is... Uh... Uh... Why is it so dark? What is that noise? Oh god, what the f The point score for each level does matter, as at the end you receive a letter grade for your time, number of kills, and score, with S being the best rank for each and P being the best rank overall. For getting a P rank on each level in the act, you unlock a special door with something very fun inside. In addition, every level also has an optional challenge to complete, like killing only one enemy, complete in under 30 seconds, drop Gabriel in a pit. Challenges, secrets, and secret levels don't give you anything except for bragging rights, which didn't stop me from doing them. All of them. I can quit any time I like, okay? There's a famous saying that's existed about as long as first-person shooters have, first uttered by the lead programmer of Doom and Wrinkle in the Fabric Reality, John Carmack. The quote goes as follows, Story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. This quote has since been beaten to death, rolled up inside a carpet, and driven out into the middle of the desert to be buried, but it is one that is still kind of relevant. I can enjoy a game with a terrible story if the gameplay is fun, but if the gameplay is terrible and the story is also bad, why would I play it? Ultra Kill does have a story, and one that I actually find very interesting. The story is written in enemy descriptions, on terminals at the end of secret levels, in the environmental design, a couple of books, and in the handful of dialogue lines the game has. The point is, the gameplay comes first and foremost. 
Ultra Kill's depiction of heaven and hell is very interesting, but I don't really think about it too much while partaking in my blood gushers. They make me the gush. The story is also not finished yet. Ultra Kill is only about two thirds done in terms of level count, so I'm not really going to say anything more about it. Besides, I promise it'll be much more fun for you to put the pieces together yourself. The only piece of lore I'll give you is this. Mankind is dead. Blood is fuel. Hell is full. And Gabriel fucking sucks. So, what is there to do after you beat all the levels? Besides the secret hunting, challenges, and P-ranking all of them? Well, there's also an endless arena mode called the Cybergrind. For a while after I beat the game, I would play a round of Cybergrind or two every day. Plus, you can just try and speedrun using new techniques you've learned, or try and pull off increasingly elaborate tricks, something I'm not very good at. You can also fuck around with the settings and try and play the game as indecipherable pixel soup. Plus, a recent-ish update added the place all too familiar to me, as a sandbox mode for you to see what kind of absurdity the game can handle before it becomes a slideshow. You can enable cheats in the regular levels too to see how quickly you can melt both the RPC and Gabriel. New content is being added fairly regularly, which leaves me afraid that this video will be even more outdated than it already is by the time I finish it. There are plans to add modding support with a very flexible level editor so this game can continue to live forever. Just fork over the 20 bucks already, or wait for a sale. The game will still take your money with merchandise. I have a piece of art from it on my computer desk. Some of the other merch is... unique? I think I've said everything I want to say about this game. Also, subscribe for more shitty content another year or so.